CD anyway. Mm -hmm. The National Archives of Australia is responsible for caring for the most significant records of the Australian federal government. For the society to trust government information and data, they have to be authentic, reliable and usable. The National Archives provides leadership and best practice management of the official record of the Australian government to ensure that information and data of indeed significance are identified, secured, preserved and available to everyone. And these are kind of very high level general words, but they're very pertinent to the projects that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Of course, we live in a digital in interconnected world, and to have it explain to us how interconnected it can be in uh, one part of the world. But for us, the archives of tomorrow are created now by government agencies doing their business digitally, online, with the involvement of the new and also new technologies, and using very, very, very strange technologies that result in very complex objects for us to preserve as archivists. Challenges of preserving the most significant part of the outcomes of government work are countless. And where the National Archives know that only high quality, reliable data and information can provide support for an accountable government <coughs> to individuals. What the National Archives of Australia preserves is the public benefit into the future. I hold in support government accountability and transparency in form decision making, protect citizens' rights and entitlements, and contribute to Australia's shared collective cultural heritage. And these three points are actually our high level principles for appraisal for how we select what should come to the archives in the future. And in a constantly changing technological environment, it is important that we face the challenges and seize the opportunities presented by it. We need to update our tools and processes to fit into the contemporary world, and we cannot afford to be in an almost proverbial archival basement. New thinking, thinking about new things, doing new things, at least trying to do new things, has been the focus of my team, my team's work in the past few years, even when the team itself changed significantly. We're constantly on the lookout for innovation opportunities, including scanning technological capabilities and how they could be put to serve in the archives. As one of the major challenges to address, we picked up appraisal and its implementation and asked the question whether new technologies would help us to make these processes more efficient, reliable, explainable, and consistent. This was started about six years ago. One of the reasons we picked up appraisal, because our team then was responsible for issuing disposal and retention schedules to agencies. In the next few years, some of us moved to another part of the National Archives, and we're now the information governance team that is responsible for the archive's own records and data management, including selecting which part of our corporate records and data should be part of the National Archives collection in the future and what can be destroyed. It is very convenient when you do projects because we can experiment on our own records. Try new approaches, and if we're confident in the results, we can offer it to other agencies to scale it up and to try it out. This particular talk is about some, a couple of very recent projects, but as I said, we started about six years ago, and we dipped our toes or our fingertips into that list that you see on the slide. We dabbled a little bit with text mining, machine learning, artificial intelligence. There's the confusion matrix, which thoroughly confused some of us. Uh, confusion matrix are the outcomes of using machine learning um, and using um, some classification algorithms. Uh, we delved into semantic web. We familiarized ourselves with knowledge graphs and graph databases and natural language processing. It is very important to try to understand um, how these things work, especially when you talk to the IT industry. And this is just a very brief and very quick illustration of our own semantic analysis. Um, we asked ourselves questions, what role do the words play in the instructions? What is significant? 
and should become an archival record. Machine learning is based on analysis of language in order to identify semantic structures and apply algorithms that help to identify the most relevant elements in text and understand the topic discussed. So this is semantic analysis done by humans very early on in the piece. Our trials to one side, here's another observation. Everyone who tries to delve into technological innovation would know that it is not cheap. It is not a cheap exercise. Or even when it starts cheap, when you want to do more, it becomes much less cheap and much more expensive. And archives are not usual institutions that get money thrown at them, including government archives, although yes, we're in a much better position than some of the community institutions. In any case, we don't have enough money, nobody does. So it is important to be on the lookout for funding opportunities, and in 2018-2019, we received such opportunities for a couple of projects. The first project was funded by the Platforms for Open Data Program by the Federal Australian Government, and this collaboration between National Archives, the Department of Finance, and CSIRO. CSIRO stands for the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, Australia's National Science Agency. And it was Data 61, the data science part of CSIRO that provided the expertise and managed the project. As part of the National Innovation and Science Agenda of the Federal Government, the, open, the Platforms for Open Data Program provides a competitive process where government organisations can identify a problem involving um, how government data used, reused, or can be released. They can apply for a project, get a little bit of funding, and try out new things. Our other partner, the Department of Finance, is responsible for financial reporting and government resource management. The conversations about the project started when this department started a data analytics unit with the purpose to bring together and analyze government business data to inform decision making of how student public service works. The idea was to look at the concept of a longitudinal data set of government structure and functions, the connections between them um, within the past 10 years. The lack of such data was seen as a major barrier to a lot of desirable analytical projects across government. And of course, a lot of National Archives work is based on identifying government functions and tracing their move between government agencies across time in a systematic way. It is our business to provide context for government records that become a covered resource in Australia through tracing the provenance, documenting it, and any changes in functional assignments to agencies through time. We make appraisal decisions also based on the functional analysis of government activity and authorised disposal of records through issuing function-based disposal and retention schedules or records authorities as we call them. And the Department of Finance in its turn had its own data sets that trace um, the structure of the government in the now, currently, and also um, trace how money is spent, in particular through portfolio budget statements. In the end, we'll agree that the broad aim of the project will be to make information about government structure and functions more available and better integrated, and also in a machine-readable format as linked data, and to see where it leads us. We put joint application, submitted, got through, and the work was done between July last year and just concluded in September this year. Responsibilities for government functions, such as specific policy areas, programs, move between um, government agencies through time. Usually through the machinery of gov government changes which occur very often after elections, but there could be other events. And as a consequence of such events, a government function could move from one agency to another or can be dispersed between various agencies. An agency could be closed and its functions either discontinued or taken over by another agency. Our project was to, to set up um, was set up to test whether a method could be devised to better track changes in the association between government organisations and their performed functions over time. The, the importance of this for the National Archives is obvious. Records follow functions and we need to know which agencies inherit control over which records, both for transfers to the archives, authorised destructions and for access. And what is a spine? A spine, as a scientist explained to us, 
is a set of entities and terms, such as vocabularies and data sets and ontologies, that relate to similar key concepts across multiple data sets. The government functions file captures references to functions of government in multiple data sets. A longitudinal spine tracks the changes in the functions over time. We had lots of discussions which data sets to use, what to try, what to connect to each other, and ended up with selecting four data sets and seven vocabularies. And I won't um, torture you with um, <laughs> describing one by one what each one of them is. But there are different, uh, different class functions classification systems used by the Department of Finance, Australian Bureau of Statistics, and the National Archives of Australia. One of the interesting data sets wasn't a data set at all. It means to the arrangement orders. They're textual documents issued by the Governor General when formal responsibilities um, of the ministers in government change for whatever reason, again, usually after elections, but could, um, could happen by the time. This was the smallest data set, but you wouldn't believe how much time the scientist spends on preparing it and discussing it. Uh, there was data quality issues, there were multiple sources for these documents, they're published by four different government organisations, including the archives. The National Archives set of these documents was um, the most comprehensive, although not without reproach. It's in the most inconvenient uh, for data science format, PDF. And here's just a quick run through the current information about government agencies the Department of Finance maintains, but it didn't, it didn't have the proper longitudinal element to it. The changes to agencies and their structures in time go back only about five years. The project originally was um, to go back 10 years, but we had to shorten it a little bit because of some deficiencies in data available. This was for the budget statements. Um, what, did the, what did the archives contribute? Even during the initial conversations, it turned out that the National Archives was the only agency in government that has mapped changes in government structure and functions across time in any systematic way. The main archives data set came from our database documenting records provenance, information about government agencies going back to 1901 to present day, systematic, structured, usable. We had some additional archival tools such as a thesaurus, functions based thesaurus. This is a historic tool. We don't maintain it anymore, but it's still used in our um, online catalogue to help with discoverability. CRS Thesaurus, that was the previous tool, um, was used to create Australian Government's Interactive Functions Thesaurus for online discovery of government information published online. A few years ago, we converted it into link data. Um, this is a visualisation of it. So it is available in machine readable format. And we also submitted the functions extracted from our retention and disposal schedule for core businesses, as we call them. So all this was processed. Each of these data sets received a data model. Uh, ontologies were created, and the link sets were created. The link sets are crosswalks or mappings between various functional classification data sets to show relevance or at least closeness. So link sets in a way are data sets themselves. They document that element A2 and data set A is relevant to element B1 and data set B and so forth. So what, what is the spine? So the spine is a collection of data sets, of link sets. It's a collection of ontologies, data models. There is a graph database which contains all these data sets as triplets. There is a very basic website, not publicly available yet, which brings it all together and has a very rudimental um, query capability using Sparkle query language. What we learned from that, we learned that we have some very useful data 
and it can be converted into machine readable format relatively easily in comparison with some other data sets. What can we do with that? That's the next question and we'll be thinking about it in the near future. I'll go back to the second project we've got. Um, the funding for it came from the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science. Again, we didn't have money, we didn't contribute it. We didn't get any money, this is not for us. This is the Australian government's program to encourage industry development. So it's uh, aimed at small to medium-sized Australian companies to give them some money to work with government agencies on particular challenges. And there are three, ch um, three stages to this process. The first selection process involved us directly. You could submit a challenge and it would be um, discussed and ranked within the Department um, of Industry. Uh, we had to present and convince that our challenge was worthy of um, being funded to be solved. And we did go through. Um, earlier this year, the Minister for Industry, Science and Technolo Technology approved five challenges to be funded. With challenge five, automating complex determinations for student government information. Yes, it is still trying to see how appraisal could be made more efficient, more consistent. Um, and how we can take the benefit of technologies without losing um, what we need to be done and with the quality that we need. So the next process was after our challenge came through, then we could select up to four companies who would apply for our challenge. With the feasibility study process, um, working through them for three months. And that's what we did in July, September. We selected four companies and worked with them, explained to them our processes and what we need. And the feasibility studies have been submitted. And the next stage is to the proof of concept. The proof of concept is a really serious stage. We could select up to two companies and each one of them would get up to one million dollars. And it's a very big deal for um, for our organisation and they can work for the next 12 to 18 months with us trying to solve our challenge. So at the moment we're waiting for the four companies to complete their studies, um, to finalise them and to apply for the proof of concept stage. Probably don't need to tell you my very long what the challenge is about. I want to see how appraisal could be automated or which parts of it could be automated. And there are two sides to it. The actual process of creation of records authorities, records disposal um, and retention authorizations. And then there's actually applying them to actual to the records, making disposal decisions with the, with the records. At the moment, we did say it's labor intensive and manual process and complex process. It is a very enjoyable process, I must say. Um, it is an analytical process, but we are looking for easier ways. What we do at the moment, we work with every um, government agency or group of agencies who perform a function within government, make their business processes, analyze their the information points, the information inputs and outputs, the types of records, and then we put on some value judgment um, on these records. What needs to be preserved as archives, what can be destroyed, and when. Just as everybody else in the world, every archives. So nothing terribly new here. But we did ask the industry to see if we can get a completely new solution to this challenge. A new automated process for developing and issuing our authorizations. Tools that can apply these authorizations and agencies to automatically identify the value of information and then to act on these instructions to select information either for destruction or permanent preservation. And we're not saying press the red button and everything will be solved. Um, we're seeking automated decisions where it's possible and will produce good quality results and we're seeking automated decision support for more complex cases. And again, what they look like now, again, lots of text. Uh, we use language to communicate meaning, that's what humans do most, ah, oh, three minutes left, <laughs> most of the time. So there's a lot of text. There's an example of a function. An example, again, lots of words, example of a disposal class, the uh, criteria through which we impart the value 
value judgment onto individual traffic mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I can't comment on individual submissions because we're in the middle of a crisis of a valuation. So just some kind of generic notes. We're still in the middle of this particular innovation journey. I don't know yet for sure whether we're building a new mass mission probe to take us into the future, whether we, we will end up with a Starbuck making trips from Barrow Dwarf and back, locked up in the loop of time without visible progress. Some observation I have are quite positive, and I don't think it's a Starbuck. So here's what I observed. All companies suggested the use of machine learning and the natural language processing for metadata and to content. But are very excellent tools for entity extractions, use of classification algorithms, and topic modeling. Very good results, high quality results to deliver on identification um, of topics, the topic modeling processes. But what can they deliver on, the, on identification of value? of certain records within last volumes of records on the same topic. It's an open question. Knowledge graphs feature prominently in suggestions. Um, semantic analysis and ontologies are important elements to try out, and we're not quite sure um, where that would lead. And if you remember the first one of the first slides with our technology scanning, we pretty much already encountered these technologies ourselves in the past few years, so it was very important to have this knowledge. Uh, we were not as dazzled as industry expected us, us to be with their, um, with their pronouncements to us, and we're much more critical, and I think that leads to better results when you work with the industry. Just some last, um, last observation on that physical and moral defense of the record or of the archives. What I learned from this project is that we can mount this defense and to quote my favorite band, Australian band, Kate Empire, our weapons are our instruments and uh, our archival principles are our strongest, our strongest um, instruments and defense tools. Um, Fabian's principle and provenance, as we document, they, they still stand. It is it is possible to maintain our archival principles in the digital world and it's possible to use our data um, in the service of machine learning. Provenance is very important in data science, in semantic web technologies, in interoperability, and this is the strength of archives and of the national archives in these particular cases, that we were able to utilise our data in the innovation projects. When using emerging technologies, information governance is very important. What is done, how, when changes are made to training models, ontologies and other parts, all needs to be authorised and documented. Explainability is always to be discussed and sought. Every project with technology should be a co-design process. We should not let technology dictate how processes need to be executed. It is a balance of what can be changed and what should not. And I'll stop here. and I'm from the National Archives of Singapore. Singapore, incidentally, is one of the very, very small countries that Toko mentioned at the start of his presentation. We were driving across the whole country in about half an hour if you determined enough. Uh, but anyway, uh, today I'll be talking to you about uh, the records management community of practice that we are, uh, the National Archives is currently in the midst of implementing in Singapore in hopes of strengthening the management of public records across the whole government. Um, I will be talking first of all about why we're considering a community of practice and for those who might not be familiar with the concept of a community of practice, I'll be very briefly uh, giving a definition of one. Then uh, I'll be going through, um, uh, I'll be describing the two rounds of community of practice meetings that we've had so far and I'll just end off with some general reflections and aspirations for future sessions. Right, so a, a brief introduction to the National Archives of Singapore. We were found, uh, founded in uh, 1968 by the National Archives and Records Centre Act. Today we are an institution of the National Library Board in Singapore, and we are guided by the National Library Board Act to um, implement and administer a whole of government uh, records management program or regime. 
and also to advise agencies. So, so we issue regulations, we issue requirements, uh, guidelines, standards, and we advise agencies on those requirements, uh, standards, guidelines, and so on. We take custody of records and we act as the official keeper for those records uh, once they are in our custody. All in all, we service about um, 90 government agencies at different levels of maturity and different sizes. Some of them as small as just four people in an office, others employing tens of thousands of people. Uh, people are absolutely essential to the implementation and success of any records management program. Uh, my colleagues from the NAA and Estonia, they talk about technology. We're talking about something very human. Actually, incidentally, I'm also in charge of our digital preservation system. Maybe says something about how we're prioritizing both, or maybe says something about our mental constraints. Um, yeah, so uh, we, it's very much in our interest to ensure that uh, agency records managers are uh, possess the, the sufficient knowledge and skills to implement our requirements and our guidelines. And to that end, we have what we take a, what we call a business partner approach. So uh, we have nine, uh, well, the whole, with the whole, the whole National Archives, we have about 90, uh, a thousand people, that's like a thousand people. 100 people, my colleague is laughing there, about 100 people. Uh, but we have nine archivists working as, uh, in the records management department. And uh, the, we are each assigned a group of agencies, around 10, uh, that we work closely with to understand the business, the records, and to uh, appraise the records and to um, advise them, to give them specific advice on the agents. We also implement, uh, we also organize training sessions uh, quite regularly across the entire year. Um, a large variety of topics, some of them at our offices, some of them we, uh, at agencies, yeah, their premises. Uh, we also uh, have some international speakers come down from time to time to give them a bit of exposure, international exposure. Uh, I mean, the approach that we're taking, there are several limitations to this approach. Uh, to begin with, uh, nine artists serving 90 agencies, uh, it can, can be a bit of a burden. Um, also, with the training, uh, it's, it's a really top-down approach. Uh, we are the ones that organize the training, we decide the topics for training, we, we decide which issues and questions to address, um, and we, it's not possible to anticipate every issue or question that agencies might have. A lot of these issues and questions might also be operational in nature, so they are not really record-keeping or archival questions or issues, and so we're not really in the best position to advise agencies on them, and yet they need to be, um, they need to be addressed. Um, but I think it's a bit more than that, it goes beyond that, which is that, um, so I talked about uh, we have, we issue requirements and we have a regulation, but uh, until very recently, about two or three years ago, these weren't um, applied very consistently or comprehensively. And so the fact of the matter is that many, with many government agencies, there is no records management role. There's nobody performing the function of a records manager, or at least until very recently. There's actually an agency where the records management, the records management function is being performed by the facilities department for some reason. So there, there is a lack of um, this professional identity, and with that, a lot of people, a lot of people in agencies see records management as something that is being imposed on them as a burden, and they, they fight us constantly, which obviously is not ideal. So what we want to do is we want to move towards a more self-sustaining community of record-keeping professionals. We want um, people, we want agency records managers to be proactive and to take ownership of managing the records. We want them to understand why we need them to do what they are doing uh, so that they go beyond the bare minimum um, needed to meet our requirements. Uh, we don't want them, we don't want them, we don't want them to think of them as requirements as requirements. Uh, we want them to communicate and collaborate with each other to identify and seek solutions to share challenges, particularly if those challenges are of the sort I mentioned previously, the operational. It has to do with record keeping, but not record keeping issues really. And so we think that the best way to do this is to implement some kind of record keeping uh, community practice. When we came upon this idea, we had actually very little experience with communities of practice. We've never organized one or we've never attended one. Of you may not be familiar with the topic. Uh, this is a book that we referred to and we found quite useful by a uh, banger like the Matthew Schneider, Cultivating Communities of Practice. And they define a community of practice as a group of people who share a concern, a set of problems, or a passion about the topic, who deepen the knowledge and expertise in this area by interacting on an ongoing basis. Basically, a group of people committed to a domain who meet regularly. Usually, this is some kind of um, bottom up organization or coordination, and they discuss the shared problems and so on, find solutions. 
So, um, of course, it's a bit of an irony, I just mentioned that this is bottom up, but we, the National Archives, are trying to implement this. The idea is that we just get the ball rolling. Um, so, we want to see the uh, community in practice. Uh, we get the ball rolling, organize and just to a few sessions, and uh, through these meetings, encourage records managers to see themselves as members of the community, to identify with their community. Uh, to help records managers see the value of belonging to a community, so knowing that they can share ideas, benchmark themselves against each other, um, learn about what is possible. And finally, we want to identify records managers who are already committed to the idea of a community of practice, who already are enthusiastic about sharing knowledge, and we want to nurture these as potential leaders so that over time we can hopefully step back and uh, yeah, let, let the real ground, ground up work. So, um, we have had two rounds of meetings so far. The first round took place um, earlier this year, February like March. And I'll just go through what we did to organize these, these, these two rounds. Uh, this is our program. It's a three hour program that took place over half a day in the morning. And as you can see, most of the time is, is dedicated to sharing and discussion by participants. The National Archives, we really only uh, came in at the start, at the beginning. Since this was our first community of practice uh, meeting, we really wanted to take a bit of time to share our vision and uh, set down some ground rules, what we hope for the community. Uh, we also stepped right in and just to summarize what we was being uh, shared, what had been shared. But yes, yeah, so most, most time was, was taken up by agencies uh, presenting some of their experiences and also we had some good discussions. Um, so we have 90 agencies, as I mentioned, and about 600 records managers. We wanted to reach as many of them as possible. And so one way we decided to do that was to just do the same meeting twice. Um, so they had identical program on two days, same speakers, same discussion questions, and everything the same. And uh, each session we had about 50 participants, of whom we divided into groups of 10. Uh, we did not specifically say who should attend. We sent out an agenda to agencies with an invitation. Uh, we said we set down what we hoped people would get out of the program and what we thought they should bring to the program and we more or less decided to let agencies decide and figure out who should come. Um, in, in the future we might narrow down the scope a bit, but in this, since this is our first program, we just let them decide. So um, the agency presentations, we have four agencies invited to share on the uh, record keeping journey. Um, the theme that we have is managing current records, which is very broad. But uh, because this is the first session and with these four agencies, it was the first time sharing, uh, we wanted to make it easy for them to find a topic that they felt confident presenting on and having a theme this broad made that a bit easier. Also, um, we did do a survey um, before the session asking people for you know, what, what kinds of topics they would like and uh, they were broad enough that we decided managing current records was kind of a good umbrella theme. Uh, but they ended up speaking mainly about their file classification and coming up with the records management policy. And of course, at the end of um, the presentations, there was there were opportunities for questions. Um, selecting the agencies, we tried to get agencies who had established records management policies, uh, practices, and also um, who had records managers who were uh, experienced. But because again, because this is our first session, we really wanted to also invite. We wanted to include agencies who were very enthusiastic, who had already bought into the idea. And, but and, and in some cases, these were not the most experienced agencies. So we then we just took a bit of time, a bit of extra time, um, to advise them. So we took a look at their sites and what they wanted to talk about. And you know, if anything was glaring, they needed to be pointed out. We just spoke to them on the site about that. Um, so we also had small group discussions, as I mentioned, participants exceeded in groups of 10. Uh, we actually assigned the groups to make sure that agencies, uh, participants from the same agency did not sit together. Uh, we had four broad questions to select from. Uh, these were, this, these included questions that were submitted to us beforehand by the participants. We provided some flip charts for them to take notes with. And at the end of the discussion, they, uh, there was a bit of time for them to give uh, sort of presented findings. We only, we only um, allocated 40 minutes to group discussion, so we think maybe you'll agree it's a very little time, and we'll come back to this bit later. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. I actually took this line out. I don't know why I said the points I made. Yes, so this, these are just some pictures from the, the session, the first session. We had it at the, we had them at the National Library building, a very large, nice large room. To be honest, because this is our first session, we were not really expect, we didn't really know 
what to expect, whether it will be very successful. Uh, we, we have had uh, this small group discussion, discussions and presentations before at our training sessions, but uh, people were always really quiet. And so we were worried that that would happen again. But I think when the entire program is built around agencies presenting and sharing, then people understand what they're getting into, and so they're a lot more prepared to, to speak and to share. And I think people were very enthusiastic. Yeah. More pictures. So the feedback was very positive. Nearly all the participants agreed that the, the session provided them uh, with greater knowledge and confidence. Confidence, I think, is important uh, to implement a uh, cross-metric program in their own agencies. And over half actually expressed interest in sharing at a similar uh, community practice session in the future, or even to help co-organize one. Um, there were several learning points, though, for us. As I mentioned, uh, I think uh, you can see straight away that a lot of the learning points have to do with the small group discussions. Uh, people found the groups a bit too big. Um, the discussion topics were, uh, were not focused enough. People spent more time discussing what the questions were, interpreting the questions and trying to choose one, than actually discussing their answers. Uh, there was just not enough time for discussion, not enough time for uh, the, the presentations. The program needed to be flexible, so I'm both the project manager for this community project and the MC. So I had the, both the authority and the ability to sort of play around with the program on the fly. That was accidental, but I think in the future we need to be more intentional, intentional about building flexibility into the program. Um, another similar theme topic, the uh, tea break, was we needed a tea break because it's three hours, nobody's going to sit for three hours. But it turned out that the tea break was uh, really, should be seen as a core part of the program because that's when all the um, unstructured discussion takes place and I actually extended the, the tea break to, from 20 to 20 minutes for that reason because I didn't want to interrupt what was being discussed. Yes, so with these learning points we proceeded with the next round of uh, meetings which was held uh, not too long ago in August and uh, yeah, we applied the lessons. So we had smaller discussion groups, six people instead of ten. Um, we had fewer agencies sharing this time, just two instead of four. This left more time for small group presentations and discussions. And uh, this time around with the discussion topics, we came up with a lot more concrete, uh, with more specific topics, uh, with more concrete deliverables. Uh, and we assigned these topics to groups from the outset, so there was no fuss about who should be doing which one. Yeah, so this is the program. We allocated a lot more time than was really needed to each of the program items. Uh, for the theme, the, the theme of uh, the agency sharing, we had uh, managing electronic records. This is, again, it's quite a broad topic, but slightly narrower. And it's just what the agencies were prepared to share on. They shared on the development of their electronic registry systems, so the EDR, EDRMS systems. Um, one agency shared on a program, a uh, system that they had had for over two decades, and that they had been upgrading over time, and so they had a lot of learning points from that, which had a lot of problems, issues, uh, that was very productive. Another agency actually shared on the system that they were in the midst of developing, and that they are still developing now, and they took the opportunity to get feedback and to share some of their ideas. I think that was very productive as well. Um, yeah, so we assigned, for the small group discussions, we, we assigned questions on how each agency managed, I think, a kind of record, electronic record, so uh, records in shared drives, records in live systems and email records and we suggested some concrete, concrete answers that they could give. Uh, some more photos. Um, we, because of some scheduling issues, we, we tried to have uh, meetings in the morning but we had them in the afternoon as we did, which actually turned out to be better because it turns out that people have had the morning working, their brains are warmed up and so they are participating a lot more enthusiastically, a lot more actively. Also there's a smaller room, so, which we found was a lot more intimate. So did the changes help? They, they definitely did help. The smaller group discussion, uh, the smaller groups, everybody got a chance to participate when you have six people, it's easier to do. Um, the extra time allocated also helped, so I could uh, uh, allocate a bit more time here and there when I felt the discussion, the discussions were particularly productive. And uh, the discussion questions did work a bit better, but I think they can also be improved still. The discussion outputs, the, the findings in the discussion were interesting, but it was less it was still not quite so easy to see where there are any obvious applications. I think this is something that we still need to work on a bit. Uh, maybe we need to think of rethink the entire small group discussion format. Yes, so um, I mean, we'll, we will definitely be um, organizing more meetings. I think the, with the most recent meeting, the one in the ones in August, um, the, the two presenters actually spent a lot of time doing the presentations 
uh, referencing and reinforcing many of the best practices that we had that we had been communicating to agencies. And so that was actually very encouraging and very heartening because it, it I think it's a testimony to uh, stakeholder buying in and it's, it's a demonstration that it's worthwhile having such meetings to identify uh, potential record man records management champions and to give those champions a voice. So we will definitely be organizing more of these. Um, but there are things that we need to think about, I think. Uh, so we need a better way of measuring results. So feedback for both of the rounds of meetings was very positive. But I think um, we need to ask ourselves whether we are also deriving the benefits that we set out to obtain. Are we really seeing a general improvement in record keeping uh, across the whole of government? I think that might be a bit more difficult to answer, but a bit more difficult to measure. But we do need to think about these kinds of things for our KPIs, okay, rather than just feedback, because that's very impressionistic. People feel good coming out of the meetings. It doesn't necessarily translate to better work or better, a better, a greater sense of professional identity. Uh, we also, so another thing was getting agencies to present was quite difficult. I mentioned before in the feedback uh, that a lot of, that more than half said that they were willing to to um, present at future sessions or even to co-organize sessions. But it turns out that um, they were willing, but the management was not so willing. And so we need a bit, I think we need to do a bit more work reaching out to management, um, to well, doing a bit more work communicating at all levels of uh, Management departments and agencies, and getting them to see that it's worth taking the risk and presenting and sharing at these meetings. Uh, but it does mean that transitioning to something a bit more ground up might still be a ways off. Uh, finally, I thought I, we can't get away from the fact that we are at the end of the day the regulator. We, we are imposing records management requirements on people. There's always going to be a tension as long as we are in the room. Um, we encourage people to share, we say that there are different approaches to solving problems, but at some point if somebody says something that's really far off, we do have an obligation to step in and, and say something, I think. Um, maybe at some point one day we will simply not be at these meetings. Um, I, I, I don't know, this is still very much in the future, we'll think about it. But yes, so we've never, this is really our first time doing this. Uh, We've never done this before, and uh, I tried to do like a search to see whether anybody else, any other, other archives within communities and practice, and I did not find any. Maybe they're just not online, or people call them, uh, they use different terms, I don't know. But if you are doing something very similar, and you know, this is something that you're really interested or passionate about, I would really be interested to hear from you, because I think that this is an area that we will, that we're still growing in. So yes, thank you very much.